Welcome to another video. We're back with the Stax collection as it's sort of become at the moment. This thing has just blown out of proportion. It's gone much further than I originally intended. And as it turns out, I have spread myself too thin, doing too many things at the same time. So I need to close out some of these projects. And in this video, we're gonna be focusing on the final iteration of the Pro Bias board from the original design. Uh, but I thought I'd just give you a bit of an overview on what I've been doing in this space because it's there's been a lot going on. I've had my Stax L700 uh, ear pad adapters, which I've been slowly refining and changing things on. It's getting there, it's not there yet, but I really like these ear pads. They're really nice and a big upgrade from the originals. So we'll keep going with that. The transformer rabbit hole just keeps going. I love my Lundell LL1630s. I think they are an amazing transformer, especially for their size and the price. The Ed cores are probably not gonna go anywhere. I don't think I can do anything useful with them. Maybe something will change, but I'm, I'm just not happy with the amount of compromises they have. Uh, I happen to speak to Lundell uh, and I have a set of early transformers from them that I've been testing. These are a big step up from the 1630s and uh, I need to go back to them with my results and get some further advice on how to proceed. And we will do a video on those eventually once I feel that they've had a fair chance and they are what they need to be for Stax electrostatic ear speakers. I've also been working on uh, ear, uh, Stax sockets and I'm pretty close to finalizing the design for those. So I will have proper sockets that I don't have to rip out of SRD transformer boxes. These are a big step up as well in regards to how nicely the, the pins operate and slide in just a really nice upgrade from the old stacks sockets overall but i want to focus on the pro bias boards so let's uh get stuck into those and i'll take you over all the changes that have happened and what the final design actually is so the stacks pro bias board uh a lot of people ask me why did I not just use the Stax reference design from the SRDs like everyone else seems to do? Well, I actually did try to do that in my original SRD that wasn't pro-bias and to add pro-bias in. I achieved that, but it also uncovered a lot of things that I wasn't happy with. Depending on the amplifiers you had it connected to with transformers, you would end up with hum, grounding loops, um, weird things happening. And just overall, I thought the bias just wasn't clean enough using um, basically connected to mains, which is not good in itself. And there was a lot of room for improvement using modern technology. I don't know what Stax uses in their modern energizers, but you know, this is technically a 40 year old design from the SRDs. So everyone needs to keep that in mind also. It became evident to me very quickly how important the bias is. Everyone overlooks it as it just needs to be at 580 volts and that's the end of it. Not so much the case. The bias is uh, very important in regards to noise floor and you can end up with a lot of things happening in the background if you don't have a really, really clean bias. Now, IFI recognized this issue in the IESL uh, transformer box they did by the looks of it. That's why they had a large capacitor bank that would be charged up and then the charging system would turn off and turn on and turn off when it was needed. So clearly they saw also what the bias could do to the sound and isn't necessarily a Counted for in amplifier designs because the bias is a completely separate part of the whole process. That is why I designed a brand new pro bias. I guess it doesn't have to be pro bias, it can do normal bias also, but I wanted to design it using modern technology and safety because having your bias coupled directly to mains with no isolation transformer in this day and age is not acceptable also, I would say. So this is where things started. My original design, this was sort of a venture out. I had no idea what I was doing at this point. Uh, it basically was built around this MCO uh, DC to DC converter, which takes five volts to 600 volts, but we need to control this and do it safely. And that is why I used at the time an LM317 low dropout voltage regulator. Turns out this regulator was quite noisy and I was not happy with this either. This also had no protection 
other than if input views and it's ballast resistors like uh, pretty much what Stacks did also, which in this day and age, again, is not acceptable for anything that I'd be willing to share with anyone else and encourage people to use anyway. Uh, I did also try different ballast resistors on the bias just to confirm that that wasn't something everyone was just doing and not actually looking into it. But turns out 4.7 meg ballast resistor made no real difference also. And yeah, this was, like I said, just an early prototype. It, it did its job. It allowed me to figure out what I needed to improve. And uh, then we moved on to the final design. So this is the uh, final board design. Um, I haven't decided if I'm gonna do this to a proper PCB yet. I'm not very good at designing PCBs. If someone else wants to do that, then uh, I'll probably let them do it. But even on a breadboard, this does exactly what I needed to do. And we're gonna go over the schematic in detail in a second and I'll show you everything that is going on in this. And so you're aware of what it is actually doing but the biggest improvements are the crowbar system which will cut out the bias if the voltage goes too high and this lt3081 regulator which is a low noise regulator a modern regulator much better we'll go over that shortly same dc to dc converter high quality high voltage rated viche resistors it's just sort of a more mature design. So let's uh, jump over to the schematic and I'll take you through each stage of what is going on here. Right, so here is the schematic. Like I said, I don't design circuits for a living. I don't do PCB design normally. I can only do so many things in my life and I'm already doing too many things. So this is what it is. I'm just sharing this for the community. Diving in, uh, we'll go through it. There's sort of three stages to it. We have the, the DC regulation portion there is a protection portion here and then we have the high voltage sort of output side and we'll go through it from start to finish so this is all documented in case someone is curious about why I did what I did and why things are designed the way they are we start off we have a 12 volt input this will technically take anything from about 8 volts up to 30 volts without uh, the circuit failing. But you need to keep in mind that if you go above 12 volts significantly, this uh, regulator has to burn off that excess power and it will get very hot if you run it up to very high voltages. So keep that in mind. So we have a 200 milliamp input fuse that will blow as a last resort if a short happens anywhere or there's too much current draw that should not really happen, but it could. If something went wrong, I believe in putting as much protection in as possible, considering how expensive your electrostats could be that you'd be plugging into this thing. So we have a diode here for reverse polarity protection. There is a power LED here just to signify that this thing is turned on so you don't zap yourself. There is a dropping resistor here. Uh, I didn't put a value on that because depending on the LED, how bright you want it to be, you might want to change this value. So figure that out. There is... Um, uh, an input capacity here for the regulator, not necessarily needed, but I decided to put it in there since I was designing this thing. The big change from the first version of this is this LT3081 voltage regulator. So this is a modern linear design regulator. It has a lot of protection built into it. It is very low noise. It is vastly superior to the LM. 317 that I used in the first design. Now, some of it was taken from their design application notes, these 1K resistors on temp and IMON for them not being used to ground. I basically just lifted it from their recommendations. This 3.3K resistor on ILIM sets the current limiting for this regulator, which is about 90 milliamps. The whole uh, power draw is around 80 milliamps. So it's just beyond that and it shouldn't need to go beyond that. And it also limits how much current goes into the DC to DC converter to make sure it doesn't overload or that it doesn't draw too much power on power up over and over and over again. So it does hold it back a bit. The set pin sets the voltage output. I did this in two stages. So we have a 91K resistor, which takes it up to about 4.3 volts. And then there's a trimming resistor to do the last of the work that is required for setting it to about 4.7 volts. Overall, there's a range of about 
4.3 volts up to about 5.2 volts before it maxes out on either side in this one that I built anyway. The one failure I was able to recreate with this thing is if it loses the ground connection or uh, it, it it's basically not connected, then this thing jumps up to about 7 volts, 7.5 seven volts which would be very bad for whatever is on the output side of the DC to DC converter. So I did two things. The wiper is going to the ground, but it is also shorted to ground in case something ever happened to the wiper. But that is why I also added in this next redundant protection section. So this is what is known as an SCR crowbar. Uh, it uses a thyristor and a Xena diode to monitor the voltage going into the DC to DC converter. If that voltage happens to exceed this Xena voltage, it will close the thyristor, which shorts the inputs to the converter. And that will basically pull down the voltage and this will be dissipating some power. This will be, you know, putting out max power, but they'll just sort of stay locked together and the DC to DC converter is shut down. I did have a couple instances where it popped the fuse as well, but it generally doesn't unless you do it as you power it up and then it goes to max power and sort of spikes a little bit. But this is here as a redundant protection to make sure that this DC to DC converter cannot put too much power out the other side just finish up here and i'll tell you why i did that um, so we've got a voltage test point here for confirming that the crowbar is not active and power is going to the converter there is a input capacity here which was recommended by emco slash xp power they have two different names i don't know why so i followed their design guides there and i also followed their design guide to put a, a reverse polarity diode on the input for the converter. So this is rated for the maximum voltage that would be on the other side, even though that should never get back across out this way, but I did that anyway. There, now you'll see 5.1 volts here. This should be a maximum of five volts. Just keep in mind that uh, this diode has a voltage drop of about 0.6 volts. So what this is seeing is actually more like 4.4, 4.5, volts in reality so just keep that in mind it's um that test point is not reflective of what's actually going into the converter now the converter itself the reason why i put this input protection here is because this will not shut down at five volts if you go past five volts the output voltage climbs relative to the input so you need to keep that in mind this has short circuit protection where it will shut down but it does not have over voltage protection it is a half watt dc to dc converter and i was easily able to hit 700 volts on the output and even go way beyond that if i kept going which i won't the converter itself can operate with the ground on the input and output tied or you can keep them separated in my experience from my testing I would keep the ground isolated on the output side so there is no noise going back and forth uh, between the grounds with anything bleeding through. On the previous one with the LM317 I did find a significant improvement to noise by disconnecting the ground from the input and output side but that might not be an issue with the new regulator but like I said you can float the ground because you're using transformers anyway and I would just keep the output side completely isolated. So the 4.7 microfarad, that capacitor, that's that big blue capacitor, film capacitor that is on the board. That is a 900 volt rated capacitor from Epcos, which was really nice. There is a 2.4 meg bleed resistor from Vichy. So these two work together in some interesting ways. This bleed resistor will load the regulator to make sure the voltage is stable and also help control the ripple the 4.7 microfarad capacitor is like just sort of for voltage stability and also to slow the climb of voltage so it takes 15 seconds roughly to reach maximum voltage and it's a nice gradual climb up to that point it doesn't just go straight to 580 volts which i think is not very good 
for electrostats. You want it to just sort of come up gradually, not just sort of hit the, the diaphragm. And this uh, resistor will bleed off that capacitor on shutdown over 30 seconds and it will also bleed uh, discharge the electrostats you have connected to this system so that is good because it means you don't have to unplug your electrostats to discharge them you can just leave them connected and the whole thing will discharge itself after about 30 seconds there is a 0 0.01 microfarad capacitor over here which is a ceramic uh, which is just there for additional noise suppression. I found it made a tiny improvement, not a massive improvement, but it's there anyway. Uh, we have our ballast resistors. I decided to have two separate ballast resistors for two separate outputs. You don't need this technically. Stax doesn't do this, but I think having your electrostats, say two pairs of them directly connected to each other on the bias is probably not a good thing. So I decided to give them their own ballast resistors. And then we have the ground output here, which just goes to the transformer center taps. Right, so that's it for the video series on this DC to DC converter. I need to get back to some other projects. I just wanted to share this with the community in case someone else wants to build one of these for themselves. I had questions about doing PCBs for it. Look, I may do it. I need to think about it because the amount of work it's going to take to design this with all the footprints of everything is a significant time investment and there would have to be enough people that would want this to justify it. And the other issue is this DC to DC converter. Like I said in the previous video, it is expensive. So this is not like a cheap thing to make and it is still cheaper than buying the Lundell mains transformers, which is what other people were doing. You know, we're still looking at overall for this board about 300 Australian dollars, which would be around 200 to 220 US dollars to build this thing, mainly because of this DC DC converter, which runs about 250, 260 Australian dollars. There are other converters available, which are probably a lot cheaper from dubious Chinese sources. Keep in mind that you are plugging this into your electrostats. And if this thing fails or it does something stupid, and goes to very high voltages, you could fry very, very expensive electrostats. I plan on buying X9000s soon, I hope. I'm trying to justify the cost. One day I will have them, but uh, I feel like this is worthy of driving X9000s. It has enough safety and it has enough protection. Make sure nothing ever goes wrong. So yeah, hope you enjoyed the video and I will see you in the next one.